Thank you very much and welcome to day two of Carriers World. Um, we're here to talk about market entry and competition issues and I note that last night there was a bit of competition for parties I understand with two different parties on. Uh, but healthy competition and they sounded like they were both very successful events. Um, but back to uh, the proceed matters with um, our session this morning. We're very lucky to have two very well credentialed participants in the region in terms of uh, their experience and knowledge of being able to enter new markets um, in our sectors uh, in this region. We're seeing it from two very different perspectives, but I think that we'll be able to tease out some commonalities between the views um, that both Michael uh, on my left and then Owen uh, could see in terms of how they approach markets. Um, just to, to give you a little more background on, on Michael, uh, Michael Clusel's business is more focused on the consumer side the retailing side in new markets, whereas Owen Best's Reliance Group is more around wholesaling and delivering services to uh, enterprise customers. So with those sort of contexts in mind, I'd like to kick off with a uh, first question, a very general question to you both, which is around um, how do you go about identifying uh, a new market opportunity, Michael, and what characteristics would you first look for? Well, if we're looking at a a new country to enter or not to enter. I think the, the top three things that we look for is first of all, how big is the pie? Right? Um, how big is the market size, number of subscribers, RPU, etc. Secondly, we look about, since we're mainly an emerging markets operator, we look at future growth potential of the market. Where's the penetration of that? We're talking 60%, we're talking over 100%, it makes a big difference. And I think thirdly, we'd be looking at the regulatory environment. Um, you know, we operate in a lot of emerging markets with very difficult regulatory environments, underdeveloped regulatory environments, uh, non-independent regulators, and uh, uh, our you know, path has shown that you know, we can run into issues that can seriously uh, derail business plans. So regulation, market size, and uh, uh, future growth. Future growth. Yeah, that's correct. Um, Owen, did you add to any of those? Yeah, some similarities, some differences. I, I probably should just declare my hand a little bit in terms of the model that that we we have. As um, as Matt said, we're both wholesale. We have subsea networks globally, and a, a product stack that sits right through layers two and three on top of the infrastructure. Um, so, so obviously we have interest in selling into and, and out of uh, markets, but on the on the enterprise side, a slightly well, a very different model um, where we rely upon uh, suppliers and partners. So, so essentially the model there um, and our core business is really about outsourcing uh, WAN networks from uh, multinational companies, essentially or, or global enterprises. So. One of the criteria, uh, similar to Michael, uh, of course, is the environment of business. And I, I, I think I would just broaden it a little bit to say it's not only regulatory, but it's also the commercial environment and the legal environment for us. Uh, because you can have, a, uh, at least on paper, a productive regulatory environment, which is stymied nonetheless by commercial behaviour, which is condoned, which stifles or, or, or modifies competition. And also legal environment, very important, uh, because if you've got intellectual property within the country, uh, you need to know that um, that is safeguarded. So um, I think the environment part of it very important, the, the quality of partners that are available and, uh, and how able they are to deliver the types of services that you're able to deliver. That's, that's very important to us. Um, I think also going back to the market size, uh, from our perspective, it's not only how much is available there, so in the wholesale sense, that translates to uh, how is the market growing, what is the penetration of broadband services, and therefore how much does that produce in terms of volume uh, in and out of the country. That's important to us on the wholesale side. Um, on, on the enterprise side, we have an existing base of customers. And of course, if they are doing business in these particular markets, that becomes 
important to us to also have a presence in the market to be able to deliver a uniform quality of service and, and class of services uh, for our existing customers into those markets. In other words, to try and help them penetrate in there. And we can talk a little bit more about that later on. So, so that's that's probably the yeah, issue. We'll talk through our, the theme there. I think is, is collaboration with both the suppliers as well as the customers from your perspective. Whereas you need to be a bit more nimble in your entry. I suspect Michael will tell you to do that. Yeah. Um, we just heard from Owen some of, about some of the areas to avoid and to, uh, or matters to take into account uh, as risks when looking to market entry. Um, Michael, would you add to any of those? Well, yeah, well, I mean, alarm bells go off for us, you know, on uh, crowded markets, you know, markets with too many players, you know, we operate, in, in my neck of the woods, you know, in Cambodia there's 12 licenses, and in, in Vietnam there's 7 licenses, you know, a far cry off for all my few recommendations, and uh, this becomes particularly alarming when you combine it with uh, high levels of penetration and low RPU. Uh, low RPU is not an issue if you're India, right? you should have scale. But if you're Cambodian and you have 12 million people and $3 RPU, there's a problem. And uh, obviously these kind of things is uh, uh, weighing very much on, uh, on our... Um, uh, so in that sense, it's not just the size of the pie, but it's the spend within the pie. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the commercial environment obviously is, is, uh, is important, right? But uh, we see that in general, in most of our markets, when we can make it a marketing battle, we win. But if we can't, we lose. Right? So we are relatively confident of our product design and you know uh, brand and commercial capabilities. But if you know things like the legal system or, or regulatory environment come in and do not allow you to uh, use your playbook, uh, then that complicates matters considerably. Well, let's come back to uh, the regulatory and, the, and perhaps the role of government and policy uh, a little later. But I'd like to explore, just in terms of um, market entry, some of the horizontal strategies that you might might look to there. Michael, I'm thinking of, um, well, I've talked about partnering with other, well, partnering both with your customer as well as a supplier. I'm thinking with more of your consumer focus in the mobile space, um, you would need to look at some value-added services and that would also involve partnering when you're delivering services? Well, certainly, I mean, there is you know, owning as much as possible of the, of the value chain is interesting, right? And uh, for, for, for any business, and it's something that we, we have to take into our considerations. And obviously you have uh, MSPs, Boeing, uh, ISP, you have uh, Nokia selling content, and you know, I mean, everybody is, is trying to branch out on a, on a, on a horizontal uh, level as well. I think you have definitely um, room to, to grow your business there. I think Austria Telecom just you know, launched cloud services by, by being the first in their market to, to strike a strategic partnership in, in that area. And there's, there's certainly opportunities. Um, on the other hand, we also have to keep in mind okay, where is our core competencies? Right? I mean, we, we have to focus on, on those core competencies, I think. And if you focus on too much, then you really focus on nothing. So it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword that we need to, 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 to play it uh, properly. But I, I think that, that all these horizontal expansions are in, in their nature mostly tactical. Right? I mean, uh, long term I think our business models will have to change considerably. And uh, in the meantime, horizontal expansions will, will help you know, create additional revenue streams, stabilize margins, uh, and uh, worth exploring and, and, and realizing, but I think they're basically tactical in nature. And produce a holding pattern that's yes. treading water. Yes. Correct. Um, Owen, from the enterprise customer's perspective, um, are you looking to provide more cloud-based services as well on, on top of your infrastructure? Absolutely. Um, if, if we look at our horizontal opportunities, uh, I would say that getting closer to the customer is, um, is an Priority. So, in terms of how you might expand into a market horizontally, I would say, uh, for example, acquisition of systems integration capability or something like that, which gets you right uh, to the customer. But we, I mean, if if you look at um, the way cloud services are evolving, the real enabler for cloud services uh, is large-scale data centers that uh, have excellent economics. 
And really, if you look at data centers, the, the big drivers of the economics of, of data centers is around the cost of space and the cost of electricity. And in some markets, specifically within Asia, there are very good propositions available uh, in terms of very low cost and high quality power, electricity, and, and also cheap space. So it, going into a new emerging market, and I, you know what immediately springs to mind is places like Cambodia and so on where there's a lot of uh, cheap power available and uh, there's no reason why you couldn't consider uh, such a place as, as, as a good place to host a large scale data centre. Now, if you have that base, then you're in a very good position to uh, roll out your cloud services because you do need the economics uh, in order for the cloud services to be viable. And one thing also about an emerging market, that if you've got a customer base of enterprises who wish to enter a new market themselves efficiently and quickly, there is nothing like cloud services to enable them to uh, to scale their business very quickly rather than have their own infrastructure. So um, the model for them becomes OPEX rather than CAPEX, and I think that's attractive to, to the customer base. Absolutely. I think um, even in a more developed uh, market such as Australia, where, where I'm from and the business um, that we're moving to in Australia is more around deploying data centers in, in Australia. Um, looking to um, provide those applications uh, as a service level to, um, to, to uh, customers, enterprise customers, to allow them to grow at a very fast rate uh, as and when they need that. That's certainly echo our experience of that. Well, I think, I think for us, it's, there's a, there's, I mean, we aren't full spectrum of what you would call cloud services, but, um, and, and I'm sure Michael's, uh, what you're looking at is different as well, but you know, already we are providing enterprise customers with, with outsourcing. Now, out, outsourcing isn't far away from platform as a service, if you like. Uh, it, it's just it's just a different level of, of how much control a customer has, as opposed to you having the control of their WAN and what sits on it. Um, so it, it's the balance of that. But from our perspective, uh, we are also very interested in developing uh, our portfolio to include unified communications as a service because that's right in the sweet spot for us. So, so that, that is an opportunity to be providing not only a customer's global WAN but all of their comp services sitting on top of that as a, as a service to them and they can scale it, they can take what they want, they can turn down what they want. And specifically for us, we concentrate on verticals as well. So if you take one of the verticals, it's, it's mining and engineering. So typically the customers that we have that are global are project-oriented companies. They are opening new sites and then they're closing sites. So you have to be extremely agile to be able to get services up quickly and provide them with the level of service uniformly no matter what market they're in. And uh, you know this type of thing is, is, is a good basis to be able to do that. So it's providing, allowing them to have the connectivity um, through the fixed infrastructure and then accessing uh, the services as a layer on top of that, yeah, very quickly where they need it. But but time not having to put the boxes out. There. E exactly. So so build it up, tear it down, and and not have to pay costs for places where you've stopped doing business. It's got to be completely matched in time slot to exactly where they're doing business and where they're not doing business. And the, and the staff that are deployed there when they when they turn on their, their computer each morning, no matter where they are, it's, the look and feel is very similar which is what cloud's all about. That's, this is the secret. This is why we're getting into issues about not only availability, but latency becomes extremely important. Well, it's both opportunities and risks there um, with cloud. We might come back to some of those a little later. But, Michael, I, I suspect um, the externality uh, that, that might affect your business um, and your opportunities for growth that we might not always think about is, is handset opportunities and, and how the availability and the pricing of handsets can affect your decisions about entering markets? Well, you know, primarily we're not in the hands of business, but as a facilitator, it comes into play. Uh, you know, one of the takeouts was discussed a lot again in Barcelona this year was, you know, when is the $60 uh, smartphone coming, right? Especially in emerging markets. Uh, this is uh, definitely a very interesting question because in most of our markets, 3G is long available and very, very competitive and uh, affordable rates, but the limitation of factor continues to be determined. Uh, so, so clearly handsets uh, are interesting. Also, you know, 
we faced a problem in, in, in Vietnam this year of being a, usually a third or even fourth SIM that tends to be in the pocket rather than in the phone. And uh, people were just not willing to spend fifty, hundred dollars just to try our services. So we, you know, we went to China. We did our own little sourcing project, and we came up with a with a phone that we could get a landed cost in in Vietnam for under nine dollars, and uh, sell it at a mild subsidy in the market at a price that had never been seen. And we sold a million phones like like this. And so so clearly, you know, handsets uh, come into play. Um, and uh, the more, I would say, one, one limitation of the fact about emerging markets is that usually we do not have enforceability of debt. So subsidies become an issue. The subsidies are based on mixed calculations where you think, that, okay, what's the RPU, how much subsidy can I give, uh, but it's mild and it never works for, you know, iPhone type of terminals. It will work for, for lower end handsets and as long as there's no enforceability of bad debt, that, that limits us a little bit. On, on the other hand, uh, you know, subsidizing smartphones is a double-edged sword anyways, I believe, right? Because you, you, you see how it eats into the profitability of Sprint, and in the end, every, every smartphone sold is a, is a nail on our coffin because it makes OTT players stronger. And we'll talk about this a bit in the, mm. maybe in the next panel. Yes, so it's a... Uh, uh, the enforceability of some of those contracts comes back to some of those legal issues about the, uh, the, the robustness of the legal system within the market that you would wish to operate. For example, we had a, a legal situation in Laos until rather recently where if somebody would default on a big debt, uh, you could not repossess the house of that person because the law would say, well, where is he going to live? Right? So for even for the banking sector in particular, right. you know, this, this limits the amount of you know, uh, credit that people uh, are willing to give. Let's talk a bit more in depth then about regulatory environments in particular jurisdictions. Um, I think in our discussions uh, before the panel started, we were, we were talking about some of the retail um, price controls really that were being put in as were being mandated. So this is this is not just wholesale price um, setting or price regulation, but it's a retail price setting. Um, how does that affect uh, your ability to compete within a market if a, if a regulator in, or policy maker is setting Prices. It's a major impact, obviously. Right? Uh, we have a case in uh, in Laos that is. Uh, you know, we've all heard of ceiling prices, of floor prices. You know, there's enough discussions around that. But we're a case at the moment in Laos where all promotions are forbidden, all bundling is forbidden, and there is a set minute rack price, a set SMS price, a set kilobyte price. And that's the same for every single operator. There is no price differentiation whatsoever on any level for any operator. This effectively freezes the market share of the sense. Right? So the regulator tells us, go compete on customer service, yeah? which is a little bit cynical. Right? And uh, this hampers our, our business massively because we were very successful with bundled services uh, before, and they were making up over, you know, two-thirds of our business. So what has happened ever since is that uh, obviously with a regulation like this in place, you know, our customer base drops, our output rises, the business is stable, there's nothing terrible that happens, but it freezes the market. And obviously this has impact on your long-term on your long-term business plans, right? In, in, in Vietnam we have a situation where you know, we try to launch a product and the regulator will come no, your product shows signs of dumping because you're violating the average market price. We ask, what is the average market price? I can't tell you. Mm -hmm. Okay, how am I violating it? You're 30% you below it. Well, how much can I be below? 20%. Where does it say so? Nowhere, but I tell you. And this is environments, you know, that, you know, telecommunications is a very capital intensive business. The, the, the payback periods are not months, right? They're long term, and you know, if things like this come into the fold, that means uh, uh, your, your business plan is sometimes not worth the paper it's written on, right? Because uh, we can face uh, very serious, substantial challenges to, to long term investments uh, by by twisting on, on on this way. So, government relations is a key key uh, of uh, our focus. 
I would, I would have thought that um, strong and transparent pricing uh, decisions of the regulator at the wholesale level, uh, when you're needing to interconnect with an incumbent operator uh, as a fixed new entry, would be um, would be very important to you. Um, important that there are no controls, actually, uh, because because I would say that the wholesale market, as opposed to the retail side, is is a very mature and stable market now. So. Uh, to the extent that there have been markets where it's been oversupplied, I think the consolidation is pretty much done. Uh, there are some different types of consolidation on infrastructure which are, which are still coming. Um, but, you know, it, if, if you look at um, the way markets open up, the regulator, I think, does have a job uh, in situations where you have multiple layers, where well, you have too many competitors in a given market, and they go into a death spiral. So, so you, you essentially get into a situation where they price compete each other to being non-viable, and then you go through a, a whole round of consolidation and a restart. So, so I, think, I think the regulator probably has a, has a role there to, to make sure that the best interests of the country are served. Um, my, my concerns are a little different because, you know, as, as Michael said, it's, it's a fairly um, infrastructure and capital intensive exercise to, to make a proper entry in the way we do business into a country. Now, I would rely on the regulator to be able to give me control over the assets that I'm going to use so that my future, uh, my future revenue flows are guaranteed. And, and if I could just use an example, if I'm going to connect into a data center, at which point I'm going to present my services to, to customers or deliver into the market, I need to be able to know that I can get to that data center on a, on a right of use basis for the, for the actual uh, connectivity and transport that I'm going to use to get there. Now, whether that's a right of use on a fiber pair or on, a, on some wavelengths or something like that, but if I'm constrained by the market that I can only achieve that on a lease basis, then I have no guarantee as to control over the cost base that I'm going to have in the future, and therefore my own viability. Now, that, that would, for me, that would be one of the alarm bells that we were talking about, about before. So I, I must be able to have surety over the infrastructure that I'm going to buy and use um, within the country. That's one. And, and I think another thing, which is not really regulatory, but in, in another part of government, I need to know that I can repatriate my profits as well and not, and not have my profits locked in the country and, and can't actually take it back to my shareholders. So that, that's another issue. There are, I suspect there are ways though, that you could ensure that you had that certainty around a lease opportunity. So is it always a, a build decision for uh, your company or would you also consider leasing from the incumbent for that? that we, we'll certainly take from the incumbent. Uh, a build is, is an option, but it's, it's probably the, the, the lesser option. What I'm talking about is being able to have a, a right of use, which is usually a 15 or a 20 year understanding on, on, on what we can use, rather than a year on year lease. If it's a year on year lease, they can quickly turn your business down. You, you don't have control of your own business, basically, because the infrastructure on which you stand doesn't, doesn't have a stable economic and commercial platform to do business. And so, you know, that, that, is, that is a completely turn off for us. And we, we have had case studies within the company where we have built infrastructure and in the partnerships that we have put together, and this goes back a number of years, the partner, rather than turning out to be someone who could help you monetize the investments that you made, turns out to be a jailer. So you're, you're actually handcuffed to a specific partner and not able to uh, get access to the market more broadly. Now, if, if you do that, you must do it with, you know, we, we have been caught in a couple of markets particularly like that. And I think the regular ha regulator has a role to ensure that if, if, if there is market entry, that, that the level of competition that exists within the country for us as a global business must have uh, a, an economic way of accessing the services globally that they need to have in order to be profitable themselves. And, and you know, there, there are some case studies live right now. I mean, it would be interesting to, to know what these two guys think and indeed what you think about what, you, what constitutes an open market. What is an open market? It's easy to say. But if you can do it by example, I think the only two truly open markets in Asia at the moment are Singapore.
I don't even, I wouldn't even consider Japan as a completely open market. It is open from a regulatory point of view, but there are constraints in terms of being, uh, commercial constraints in terms of the pricing to get to certain places. It's, it's counterintuitive, but, but I, I believe that really Singapore and Hong Kong, I, I would have valued that as open. I think most of the markets in Southeast Asia are, are, are certainly in principle open, but I would say constrained open. Because when you try, try to do business in those places, you, you, you are constrained by commercial behaviour of, of particularly large-scale uh, operators within the company who are given all the latitude that they need to control the market commercially. So even when it's written on paper that uh, there are clear rules and there's ways to enforce those, that, you know, one, when one scratches the surface, uh, you can find that um, those rules aren't, aren't those rules, in fact, are more opaque than what has been presented. Um, I think, in, in many ways, it's it's easy to identify when a market isn't open, when it, when, when it is uh, in this region. Um, one area that uh, government has has a very clear uh, opportunity to both turn on and turn off business, um, a new entry and new exit, uh, is in the area of spectrum uh, in in the region. I was interested in your thoughts around um, pathways for for 3G to 4G um, in the region, and how you're, how you're finding that market in terms of um, the ability to plan for the new business? Well, in, uh, we hold a 3G license and operate 3G um, services in Laos, but we do not hold them in uh, Vietnam and Cambodia, uh, but we do want them. Uh, we have LT trials in, in Cambodia and Vietnam, and uh, yeah, obviously, uh, spectrum allocation. Is a, is a big topic. Um, obviously, you know, in, in emerging markets, we always have one of the there's benefits, there's downsides of working in emerging markets. Uh, one of the benefits is we can go to school a little bit on developments in other places. Uh, not everything is transferable. There's idiosyncrasies of every market, but <coughs> there is a time lag clearly, and that gives us a little leeway in uh, <coughs> dealing with complex regulatory environment where achieving the licenses that we need uh, may take a little more time. Okay, uh, spectrum, it starts as simple as spectrum allocation. Uh, spectrum, spectrum is a limited uh, resource. Uh, it's valuable and uh, it should be distributed in a, in a way that you know, fosters uh, a level playing field and competition. Uh, in many of our markets, we find uh, operators hogging spectrum uh, being over allocated, sitting on a spectrum, not using the spectrum, uh, and you know, clawing back that spectrum is uh, particularly difficult. Even if the regulator puts their mind to it, eventually, you know, you will find operators owned by very powerful ministries, and uh, the, 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 the clawback of the spectrum proves to be very, very complicated. Um, we're lucky enough to have uh, technology neutral licenses in most of our it's good, but we do need the spectrum still. Right? Yes. So, uh, what has uh, you know softened that blow a little bit for us is that we were discussing terminal prices are still very, relatively high, and they are clearly the limitational factor to you know the explosion of 3G and you know data services in most of these markets. Right? As I said, the, the services are available and the services are priced extremely affordable. Even with low purchase power, low RPU environments, people can afford the services. But as long as people can't afford the terminal, right, um, there is going to be uh, delays. Right? We were chatting over, over breakfast, and I had a uh, conversation with uh, you know Huawei device people, and they were telling me how proud they were of selling a, a million of their one of their smartphones priced at uh, 120, 130 dollars, and I, I told them. If you can cut the price in half, you'll sell a million in Brazil alone, right? So this gives us a little time to, to address these spectrum issues, but uh, it remains a, a clear challenge. Oh, and in terms of, uh, you identified uh, Hong Kong and Singapore as, as the most open, the, the, the leaders of uh, being transparent, and, um, the rules have been set for being able to enter those markets. Um, if we were to cut the next layer of opportunity, where, where would you see um, uh, the next most viable markets uh, for entry? Well, you know, when I say Singapore and Hong Kong are most open, that's, that's as a result of they've been through a, a, 
more layers of evolution uh, to get to where they are now, and, and the other markets will certainly get there, and, and nor should we complain about that because that's that's the way uh, the the opening process is a gradual process. It's never a, it, it's not a quantum process, so it's really an exercise in um, modifying your model to to fit each particular market so that you can operate as as effectively as you possibly can. As, as far as markets that are available, I mean, there, there are new, no new markets except for one, Myanmar. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a brand new opportunity. And I'm sure, you know, the, the vultures are all circling, ready to, to find a way to, to enter the market. Uh, it's an attractive proposition. But in, in all of the other markets, if you're not there already, uh, you're, you're already too late, essentially, or at least um, you're going to have to come in in a, in a second or third phase. Now, obviously, what what could be called emerging, I, I, I don't think these markets are emerging anymore. They've arrived, they've emerged, uh, but they're, they're just going through the evolution process. Of course, Vietnam, of course, this country, Thailand, is well progressed. Um, Indonesia, uh, another good opportunity. Um, access to Cambodia, Laos, they're, they're showing great progress in, in where they're going. Um, and so that, I, I would say those are the particular markets in, in this part of the world which are particularly of, of interest. Uh, they each have their idiosyncrasies in the mix of regulation, commercial practice and so on, that's fine. Um, but you know, they, they'd be the ones that I think that, that we're very serious about and, uh, and trying to find ways, as I say, with partners to be able to provide a proper face for our services to, to the market in a, in a proper business cultural sense, uh, which are individual to each one of those countries. So that sort of second and third phase of development of a market, I think, I think that, that uh, rings true, uh, what you're saying, that, that um, they're, they're not just emerging, they're, they're part of an ongoing phase and um, growth. Is it, would it be right to say that one of those attributes of the second or third phase is, is consolidation and not just market entry, but market exit? Yeah, I think that's right. Well, it depends how the, the, the regulation and the regulator goes about it. Uh, but, you know, typically you go through a phase of, it's, it's like, you know, adjusting the brakes on your car or something. If you, if, if you don't break, if you don't moderate the, the level of competition at the start, uh, if it's too open, there'll be too many competitors and then there has to be consolidation. And you might go through one or maybe two complete phases of that before you stabilise in, in uh, operators who are truly viable and who truly understand the market. I, I think that's, uh, if, you, if you try too much to avoid that circumstance, I think you can cripple your own market. And after all, the regulator needs to be, of course, thinks about what is in the best interests of the country uh, in, in order to uh, develop the type of services because the, the business that we're in is a platform for all sorts of other industries. And so, it, it, and, and the model of cloud is interesting because the cloud model is a utility model. Um, you, you plug and you pay per unit of, of what you're using, whether it's application, whether it's, whether it's platform, whether it's um, network. You actually plug in and you use it. It's a utility model. And I think that's particularly an attractive leapfrog for a brand new market to be able to try and um, make such services available to the industries within their country rather than have them to go through generations of capital investment in order to get their, to get their markets going. The infrastructure, uh, and comms wise, that they need in order to get their, their businesses going. It's the ability to leapfrog some of those developments that have, um, those that are currently more mature have had to go through where there's a lot of unnecessary expense and the, one would think that the economy and the, the long-term interests of the end user are not particularly well served in, those, in a national sense by, by that kind of, uh, of hindsight over-investment, inefficient investment. Well, re redundant assets. I mean, the, the technology changes very quickly and, and um, you invest in your infrastructure. Within a few years, it, it is obsolete for sure in terms of its capability. That's particularly true in infrastructure. So if you just use the example, the infrastructure that we use, we're, we're going through phases now of generation after generation of DWDM on, on fibre pairs for the wholesale business. Now, you invest on 10 gig technology, 
you've got um, you've got investments sitting there in your network. There's now 40 gig, 40 gig, and 40 gig coherent. There's soon to be 100. So the infrastructure that we've already got there, from from the point of view of your CFO, you haven't begun to to, to squeeze the value out of those assets. But there comes a time when you really have to scrap them and go to the next phase because otherwise your unit cost structure is in the wrong place and you're not competitive. So you're actually now now the cloud model is agnostic to all of that really, and you're giving an opportunity to an industry. To, to jump on and scale their business quickly, purely on OPEX, and you're leaving it to the other guy to worry about the technology, you don't care about it. Both the operator and the customer, uh, they're not gonna to have to make that capital investment. Indeed. Yeah. And the cost of the capital investment by the, uh, the, the owner of the data center, or the, 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 the um, indeed the, um, whoever's paying for it at the end of the day, can be spread across all the customers. The idea of um, market consolidation, though, Michael, I'm thinking of uh, a jurisdiction you touched upon earlier, like, like Cambodia. Um, do you see that there's, there also needs to be consult market exit consolidation and shrinking of some of the numbers of suppliers? Is it sustainable, uh, the levels that are there at the moment? Well, the, the current levels are certainly not sustainable. Right? I mean, 12 licenses, you, you can see that, that the regulator should have probably put a little bit more restraint at the, at, at the beginning. The market is relatively, the particular market is limited in size, 12 million, 12 million people in the country, $3 RPU. Uh, the, the mathematics do not work. Right? So, so clearly there has to be a consolidation and uh, I think very few players can you know, indulge the luxury of saying, okay, I'm only going to look at active uh, consolidation. I think everybody will have to consider both paths and in the end it will come down to uh, who is the most hungry for investment at the moment? Uh, where somebody who might, you know, find his cash more dear, or have other markets that that, that require uh, investment and yield better returns, uh, should consider both active and passive consolidation. And you know, the, the number from twelve needs to come down here to three, four. Something where where you know our views will come to it because the views are not low because the people spend. Not a lot. It's just share like In the last uh, four or five minutes of the session, I'd be interested to hear any questions or comments from the audience. So I might throw it open to uh, to you out there with the experiences that you've had in terms of um, planning for uh, developments in emerging markets, maybe new entry, consolidation, of the, of the sorts of themes that we're touching upon here ring true, or do you have? Um, other way, other other comments that you might like to bring to bring to the discussion. Um, Michael and I share the same market, so I have a, <laughs> a lot of sympathy and support for what he said today. But I just um, going back um, to Owen's point where he talked about you know Hong Kong, Singapore, perhaps having evolved through this process to now become where they are very open and places he considers you know, um, the most open markets. So perhaps a, a question for both, I think, Michael and, um, and Owen. How long do you think it will take before some of these emerged markets, as you call them, and let's talk about Vietnam, Cambodia, Lao, in that instance, will reach that stage? What's the time frame, do you think, before you know, we'll be able to sit here and say, these are at the same level? Well, it, it, it's really um, a function of the will of the government and uh, and what they wish to do in order to um, push for you know various industries to, to a point so it, it could take uh, a considerable length of time I think if you look at Singapore it's probably uh, since and, and Singapore wasn't always open um, it's probably taken something like 20 years I would say to get to where it is now. I, I, I think that um, there are certain telltale signs in, in some of the markets which show that the level of evolution, I would say um, Thailand is, is, is more than halfway there, but there are telltale signs here. For example, uh, I note that um, operators in Thailand 
in order to uh, find their way for services out of the country are quite often going via Malaysia. And uh, so a terrestrial route, I, I wonder why that is. And, uh, and, and really, the, you know, there are, there are different signs there. So, so you know, if you wanted to put a time on it, I think uh, this country has probably got less than 10 years but it, it depends on the, on the will of the government. And in, in Vietnam, I think it's, it's got a longer way to go. Obviously, Cambodia, Laos is just setting out, and Myanmar hasn't started. Um, and, and I would say Indonesia, it's quite well progressed, and uh, I, I think it will get there within the next 10 years. I tend to agree, right, that uh, <coughs> uh, Vietnam is going to be north of 10 years, and, and, and Laos and Cambodia possibly even more that because again I agree uh, it's, a, it's a directly related to the, to the will of the government and uh, what they actually want to achieve right and you know markets like uh, Laos or Vietnam Cambodia uh, control from government side is is not seen as something bad something essential right so the concept of an open market doesn't sound particularly appealing uh, on all levels to the government. Sure, they want to join the WTO, they want to join WTO, they subscribe in part to some of the, some of the concepts, but um, you know, it's just, just five years back that we were asking Laos whether our antennas are CIA antennas by the regulator, right? This is not that far back, right? And uh, clearly now, you know, you still have very strong individual interests in the country who can take uh, influence on on the regulatory side, and I feel that especially uh, in, in, in in Laos, the case you have a very weak regulator. Right? And that's the, we actually like strong regulators, right? Uh, you know, a, a regulator who can enforce a level playing field and, and bring some planability and forecastability in the in, in, in the business plan is much more uh, preferable to the black box where. You don't know what's going to happen. I, mean, I, I can give you an example of when you know negotiating a, a spectrum fee for the WiMAX spectrum in, uh, in 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 Laos, where we get a bill without any reference how this is calculated and some completely astronomical. You have to pay two million for for that spectrum fee for this year. And I will write back, no, I will only pay twenty thousand. And then we go into haggle mode, right? It's unbelievable. Hey, you, you would think you would think that's an Egyptian bazaar. No, but this is this is us talking to the regulator. In the end, we settle somewhere somewhere in between. As, as long as <coughs> practices are on this level, it's a long way for the for the for the regulator to become strong enough, you know, and the government to, to really assert uh, some some long term, you know, strategic, you know, uh, goals and actually push them through. I think that. Um, would be difficult to put some, some months or years on an answer of when those those markets might start to uh, look more like open markets. But I think there's still some indicators that um, are relevant here that um, apart from just government decision making, and it's also when we see um, economies um, being more involved in WTO type of activities or trade agreements or multilateral arrangements, um, or indeed, when we see incumbent operators start to look to invest in other jurisdictions, and the example I think with Singapore is is very much um, what I'm thinking of there, where when Singtel started to see what it was like when it had to be a new entrant into another market, um, I think that's also when back in the home market things became a little more open, and there was um, a, a discussion, a, a dialogue could be had between both the regulator, uh, the government and the incumbent operator about the benefits to the overall economy, about making more transparent, open, um, and reasonable uh, rules of, of engagement. Prior to that, when it was a very closed um, market where Sintel was not looking to invest overseas either, um, you had um, you didn't have those dynamics at play. So uh, in, in, in a sense, once the economies start to look outward, start to expect, expand, export, sorry, their own services, um, you also find that um, the flip side of that is that there is a more opening up of the domestic market. Yeah, I think there's, there's also, um, we, we should point out that the evolution, the evolution goes on. So even in even markets that you would consider to be extremely mature, like uh, the UK or Australia or something like that, 
it's it's still going through phases of uh, of evolution and the, on this thing like unbundling the local loop, unbundling access to to pipes. Um, that that's still a, an issue. Redefining what it means a, a universal service obligation to the entire country. Where you set where you set the floor. That has that's being redefined. I mean, this thing goes on and on and on. No one ever reaches Nirvana. So, it's a, but but there is a threshold where you say yes, that that's that's enough to call that place open. Yeah. And I think on that note, that um, a very fine way to finish the session. Uh, unless there was a, another final question. Yeah. No, so thank you, thank you for your attention this morning. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.